<laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, so we're thrilled that uh, that you're going to be presenting through OTF Connects in about 10 days. Uh, the time is going to fly by. Um, we use, obviously, Blackboard Collaborate as our platform for providing OTF Connects to teachers around the province. And um, we, we like the features that Blackboard Collaborate has. And so uh, um, we find that people, once they're in, they do OK. And uh, so it's been an effective tool for us. And so we're going to just start by taking a quick look at the actual tools, just so that as we're in this session here, you'll be able to interact. And first, I should ask you, do you have any experience with Blackboard Collaborate already? Uh, not from this end, only from the receiving end. OK. All right. This uh, sounds great. So. What I'm going to do is right now you are in as a participant, and so I'm going to let you stay in the participant view for a few minutes so that you kind of see everything that the participants see, and then I will elevate you to a moderator as well, and then you'll see the, the features that change and what becomes available. In the meantime, um, when people first log into your session, they are going to be prompted to check their settings, just as you see on the page here, and um, we also make sure that they get the steps they need in order to make sure their audio video is working, that they can find their way around the participants uh, box with the communication icons there in the chat. So those are the three basic tools that we make sure everybody has access to as best we can and can find them and, and use them. And so for you today, I'm also going to go ahead to this one. This particular screen here is actually the screen that we share during a session and give people the walkthrough. So they have time to read through this. Uh, people log into the session any time between 7 and 7.30. And so we kind of go back and forth, letting them wander around on their own and play with the tools. But at about 7.22, 7.23, um, uh, we give a formal walkthrough of these tools step by step and let everybody play with them and, and try them. So. You've already figured out your dock button, so we encourage people to participate with their microphone. Uh, lots of people don't. You know, they're at home, they got their kids running around, things like that. Uh, and some people do. So we just try and make sure that they know how to use it if they're comfortable and have access to it. And uh, we really encourage the use of the communication icons, which you find underneath your name in the participants <laughs> box, especially the different smiley face tools, you know, when they hover on that and, uh, and select a thumbs up or something like that. You can use that throughout your session to say, OK, give me a thumbs up if you found that uh, useful or if, uh, thumbs down if you have some questions or, or something like that. Um, the next icon, oops, let me just change to my pointer hand here. Uh, we also let people know about uh, stepping away from the session. Because they're on their own time, we are respectful of that. And if they need to leave their computer, we do find it's helpful for us to know. Because if you incorporate an activity where you're looking for people to all uh, give a, a response to a question that you've shared and you don't see a response from a couple of people and we wonder if they're having technical issues, if they didn't understand the question or something like that, if we make sure that they let us know if they have to step away by clicking the head with the clock on it, as I've just done, then we know they're not at their computer and so you don't have to wait and wonder about them. And then when they come back, we encourage them to, to click their icon again and let us know that they've rejoined the session. Um, if you have a large group, and when I say large, let's say more than medium to large, uh, any group that's more than eight people, um, we encourage them to use the raise hand button in order to uh, kind of ask to jump in with a comment or a question, uh, whether, and that's usually for people that are using their microphone, and that just helps you as a facilitator manage the group. So if you open the floor to questions, and we we, we typically only have a three or four microphones that can go on at once, and it can get pretty chaotic pretty quickly if we don't have some order to it. So we do ask that people raise their hand um, in order to be prompted, and then you can call on them in order. Every time someone raises their hand, there'll be a different ordinal next to their name, and then they can put their hand down again. And that hand button, when they click on it, it didn't for me, but when participants click on it, a little bell goes off, so you get an audio indicator of when someone's raised their hand. OK. Mm -hmm. And then, and we're going to walk through more of this stuff later. Um, and then we've got the polling tool, which we 
we are going to talk about later as well. But those are the key icons that we draw people's attention to. And then, of course, the chat box as well, and we let them know that they can resize it. And for you as a facilitator, we definitely recommend that you unpin your chat, chat box and pull it off to the side, uh, shrink down your Blackboard Collaborate main window a little bit so that your chat can stand alone off to the side so you can see, uh, stretch it out and see a lot more of it of, uh, of what's going on. People do use the chat a lot. And if you have a medium to large size group, which so far you've got 30 registrants, I wouldn't be surprised if we have 40, 45, or even more registrants by the time your session actually happens. And our attendance rate is anywhere between 30 and 50 percent of the, the number of registrants. So that should be a pretty good size group. Now, the week that you're presenting, we never know because, you know, lots of holiday things are happening at schools and things come up. For, for teachers with their own families sure. as well. So we'll, we'll do our best to promote it as much as possible so that we still get a good crowd in there. Great. OK. All right, so then we're also going to talk about the whiteboard tools later, but this is what participants see. And this is also the title slide. This is a sample one that people will have when they first enter into the room so that they know they've landed in the right spot. But when you do your presentation, it's great for you to also have your own uh, introduction to your own presentations, uh, title slide with some contact information for you. OK, so now we're getting to our agenda. This is what we're going to go through today. Uh, Siri's going to give you a little overview of the program. We're going to talk about the role of the guest facilitators, uh, talk a little bit about what the goals are for your particular session, what kind of learning you want to be able to, to share with them. Uh, we're going to go into a few more specifics about the tools in terms of how they relate to engaging your participants, and, and then talk a little bit about planning your session. And at any time you have any questions, jump in. Raise your hand. You've got your mic on. Uh, we're pretty informal here. And uh, it's been a few months since I've done uh, an in-service. So I may be a little rusty. So <laughs> feel free to interject <coughs> and ask questions. OK, Syria, okay. are you able to turn your mic on again? I am. Um, but we will ha all, might have other little voices in the, in the room. So bear with me. So Brian, welcome. Um, I'm so happy, really, that you were able to join our OTF Connects team this year. Uh, I was really impressed uh, with what I heard when we went to the Connect uh, conference back in the spring. So I'm really happy that uh, that you could join us and do several webinars for us this um, this year. <clears throat> Generally, um, OTF Connect. Uh, was designed to provide um, PD for teachers and to connect teachers from across the province. Um, we used to have, uh, there was a, a time when I worked at OTS and there was funding to do a lot of face-to-face. -face. When that all went, we came up with the idea of OTF Connect um, and to continue to provide our educators with the real high quality professional development and um, right at their home computer. So we came up with the 7.30 to 9 time, which seemed to be the best of the time uh, for uh, teachers to be able to attend. And this way, it allowed them to be in a live session and connect with other teachers from across the province and, and have that opportunity to, coll to collaborate with others and be in service by amazing facilitators like you who have a lot of knowledge, experience, and passion for what you do. Um, we, in, in OTS Connect sessions, we utilize the principle of adult learning. And as Louise uh, mentioned earlier, uh, teachers are giving of their own time in the evening <laughs> when they could just be sitting and relaxing, but they're there with us. So we really respect um, their time and their own professional knowledge and expertise. So we always encourage them uh, to contribute and uh, really uh, appreciate the knowledge and skills that a lot of the participants bring with them. Oh, dear. Um, Louise, is everything OK? I know Laura's touching all sorts of uh, She's sending us here. some wonderful chat messages. Looks great. Yes. I love the telephone, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Great. As long as she hasn't touched anything else. Um, so, <laughs> so we always encourage 
encourage them to 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 collaborate. Uh, in a session we did last week, the facilitator had so much information to share, and um, and so there were questions in the chat, and others in the room just quickly um, added answered in the chat. So it, it was wonderful to see that. So if you could provide um, that kind of uh, environment. Um, we also, when you're preparing your webinar, if you could remember to um, plan for interaction as much as possible through the session. And so it's more of a collaboration um, or, or allow them to participate um, so that you're not just uh, presenting the whole time. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. Makes and, me feel uh, better. Exactly. So really allow room to discussion and sharing of ideas and experience. Um, so that's um, that's really important. And then Louise will go over more with you um, the development of your PowerPoint so that uh, when you're doing that, you keep that in mind. You know, um, also, you know, especially um, be mindful of the career. Looks like we might have a little hiccup in your uh, <laughs> audio now, Syria. Is there? Sorry. Oh, there you're back now. Okay, so you're saying be mindful. Oh, yes. That's because Laura had taken that one part of my mic away, my earbuds away from me. I apologize. Um, but did you hear any of it? Uh, just you were at the spot about being mindful of the curriculum. Right. So um, mindful of the curriculum connections and uh, appropriate assessment strategies if that's applicable. Um, and again, um, teachers always like when there's some practical, uh, ready-to-use ideas that they can uh, try in the classroom um, when they, you know, eager to get back to their classroom. So, uh, Louise, did you want to add anything? Um, I think what I would probably add at this point is, um, uh, and we can talk about this as we go through as well, well, is that uh, we find that it's difficult to predict what level of knowledge and expertise uh, participants come to the session already with. And yours would be especially one that that would be a challenge with because some people will be right at ground, ground zero with coding and other people might be quite comfortable with it and want to, you know, push it further. And so that may be something we can talk about. You may want to develop a quick pre-survey that we can send with the first reminder email, which will go out on December 3rd, so one week prior. And you could gauge that. We could collect some information so that you have an idea of, of who's coming. Or you can incorporate that right at the beginning of your presentation if you're able to kind of shift on the fly and find out, you know, at 7.35 where people are at and make adjustments has needed as you go through because um, we do try and make sure everybody leaves the session with something practical and useful for their for their classrooms and um, and we often find with some of our more technology based sessions that people at either end of the spectrum uh, it's hard to meet everybody's needs and so sometimes um, kind of thinking about that as you're planning your session uh, you'll be able to ask questions and prompt discussion that's uh, that's broader and invites conversation that'll touch on on all the levels that people might be at so so that sometimes takes some time to, to develop that skill uh, knowing that who actually arrived in the session that night um, uh, could be different than than the group of people that replied to a pre-survey so we kind of go with the flow a lot and try and be as responsive as we can and teachers are very uh, supportive of that uh, because this is PD by teachers for teachers. There's a lot of understanding and appreciation of the effort that, that goes in and, and so when we're able to elicit sharing from the participants themselves, we often find that that helps meet those needs directly because they're sharing with each other and there's less uh, onus on you to, to fill the needs of every single person that's there. They kind of help each other out. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that sounds great. 
Okay, so Sir, are you okay if we uh, move along now? Uh, yes, go ahead. I'm going to turn my mic off so that you don't have the other. Um, uh, the last thing, Laura. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and hopefully the your the chat messages the chat messages may also. Stop. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you, Syria. Okay, so now that Siri has shared all that and we've talked a little bit more about, um, you know, who your audience might be, um, we'll get into a little bit of what uh, what your role is as you kind of pull all that together. Um, it is, it's, it's for you to create that welcoming, safe environment that draws on that expertise and experience of the participants. I think that, that you as a, an educator yourself who's done PD and been a participant in PD, uh, you know that when when you are valued for what you contribute, uh, you're more likely to leave with a great deal of satisfaction. Is that you, Syria, or is that Laura? Yes. No, it's, it's actually me. Um, what I was meant to tell uh, Brian earlier was that we have a facilitator guide that outlines uh, a lot of the information that he'll need, and we'll send you this uh, probably in a couple of days. Is that okay, Brian, or even tomorrow? Yeah, no, that's great. Sooner the better. Okay. okay, great. Wonderful. Thank you. We will get on that then. Okay, so uh, creating that that environment uh, where people feel comfortable sharing, and so that's part of what Siri already mentioned, that uh, you know you should feel the need that that 90 minutes is, is you presenting only, but it's, it's about creating dialogue and conversation. And of course, sharing, sharing the content and and, uh, and and what things you you do have to share that would help teachers get started with uh, basically tying to what your session description is. And of course, uh, we encourage facilitators to be engaging their participants using the tools that we've got right here in Blackboard. There's a fair, fair bit of background noise coming from you, Brian, and I'm not sure if it's maybe is your mic one of those ones that's on. Um, on your earbuds, or is it close to your mouth, or bumping on something? Yeah, it, no, it's close to my mouth. It's a headset. Okay, you may want to adjust that. I know I sometimes have problems. Let me know if uh, if it sounds like uh, my face is rubbing on mine. How's that? Okay, um, that sounds good. Thanks. And that's actually part of why we'd like to connect in advance so that the night of the webinar, we know that your technology is going to run nice and smoothly because that is extremely critical. Okay, and of course, throughout the course of your session, uh, you're going to provide resources related to what you're sharing, and I'm sure there's a bajillion resources out there that you'd like to point to teachers to for uh, for coding and computational thinking. And um, and of course, we also, you know, as adult learners, we try and also let people participate to the degree that they're comfortable with. Some people will be very new to trying this kind of online learning environment, and other people will, might be very comfortable. And so, um, so we try and, and, and allow them to participate as they would like. And the same kind of goes for you. And we expect that that you're pretty tech savvy, uh, but we also try and balance things out so that the moderator support that's there that evening, whether it's me or one of our other moderators, uh, is going to be able to help you out with a lot of the, uh, you know, putting links in the chat and helping people with their microphones and all that kind of stuff so that you can remain focused on sharing your content and ensuring that your group of learners is, is, uh, is being taken care of. And Great. we want you to have fun. <laughs> we don't want this to be a stressful <laughs> thing for you. And so we do try and, and maintain a relaxed kind of feel. Uh, these sessions aren't intended to be really, really super formal. Um, and so it is a dialogue amongst your peers. So we want you to be part of that too. Great. Okay. So uh, as you're starting to do your planning, uh, you're going to want to think about what the goals are for your session. Um, many, many times we've had folks send in a description and, you know, it could be months later before their session actually happens. And the content of the session often doesn't tie back to that initial description that teachers read when they signed up. So whatever you submitted in your description, I would let that be a really strong guide for you as you develop your content, because uh, that will ensure that people will leave the session going, yep, this is what I came for, and this is what I got, and this is great. And um, and 
uh, you know, considering when I say the entry exit level of participants, that would be the whole scaffolding and figuring out where, where they're at and what they're looking for and uh, trying to kind of uh, funnel what they need to them. Uh, and so when you think about the resources that you would like to share, you may have some resources that run the gamut in terms of skill level. And so you may say, okay, this particular page is fantastic for beginners. If you're looking for more, how about this one? And, uh, and kind of uh, meet them where they're at that way. Of course, if you have any ties to the curriculum, it's nice when teachers can see that explicitly, especially if this is something that's very new to them. They may be thinking, well, how do I do coding and still have it tied to the curriculum? And uh, otherwise, if they don't see that it will be a useful use of their time, they often will be wowed and amazed and feel like this would be so much fun to do in their classroom. But when they have the time pressure of getting curriculum done or doing something fun, they're going to see them as two separate things instead of something that they can do together. And so for you, because it is a technology-based session, you'll have that opportunity to make it, to help them see that they can do both together. Okay. The 90-minute the time frame is always something to consider because these sessions do have those interactive components. So um, lots of facilitators tend to over plan and I think that's kind of our nature. We'd always rather have more than less and uh, and that can be something we can talk about. You can do a draft and, and we can take a look at it and say, okay, I think you're going to be good here and uh, uh, allowing time for, for teachers to do some activities or even to think about examples of you know, things they're doing in their classroom and how could they bring coding into it or, or something like that. Um, you know, giving them a few minutes every now and again to do those kinds of things. You can build that in and um, and, uh, and that interactivity, you know, sometimes activities go really fast and sometimes they take longer than we thought and we kind of just roll with it. And, uh, and I think that's, that's something that teachers naturally have a skill for because that's what happens in their classroom every day anyway. Um, and of course, what educators will take away that's immediately useful. We do put immediately in there because we want uh, teachers to be able to follow through on what they've learned and not feel like they need to have four other sessions that will get them to where they can actually take it into the classroom. So uh, sometimes keeping your, your learning goals nice and simple and direct is more helpful and being able to say, okay, well, let's see if we can get you leaving with just one lesson idea that you might be able to take back into the classroom um, and maybe some bigger picture stuff that can take them to the next steps after, after that. So you can kind of use your best judgment on that and, and keep, keep those parameters in mind. Okay, this is the basic timeline for the 90 minutes. Uh, we do encourage you, the facilitator, to log on early and make sure everything's working. Um, we do ask that you send your PowerPoint uh, to us as soon as possible. Uh, typically, it would be a couple of weeks in advance so that we have time to work out any glitches and things like that. Um, so for you, what kind of time frame do you think might work for you? Um. I have quite a bit already. I think it's just a matter of fine tuning. Um, so, a couple okay. of days. Okay. Not long at all. That feels fine. If you could have something to us by the end of this week, that would uh, that would definitely allow time for us to take a peek at this end, and, and we can give you any any feedback, whether it's um, how you're planning some of the interactive components, or or sometimes the order of things. We suggest some shifting around based on on how we know teachers tend to come into the session and and uh, and what they might find beneficial. For the most part. We don't have a whole lot of comments aside from to say, can, can you make your text bigger or something like that? Um, but we always do like to see it with enough uh, time for us to kind of uh, uh, play with it and, uh, and see if there's any issues. Um, on the night of the session, so if you're able to ch log in early, um, we'll check and make sure your technology is working, and then you can step away, uh, stay logged in, but step away, and then come back just around the time that we start to do the walkthrough. That's that's totally uh, something that works for us. Um, participants log in anytime between 7 and 7.30. We make sure they're all up to speed in the technology. We give them the formal walkthrough. Uh, we do start the recording uh, right at 7.30 as much as we can. Uh, sometimes people People log in, a whole bunch of people log in right at the last minute, and so sometimes we'll pause for a little bit while, while they get settled. Um, but once the recording started, 
Um, usually Syria is the one that gets things going and welcomes everyone and welcomes you and does the introduction. And uh, But we try and move on and hand things over to you within five minutes or less of, uh, of the recording being started so that um, you'll be able to just take it away from there. And, uh, and then you've got your content and we ask you to try and aim to wind up about five to nine so that we can get to our thank yous. We've got some resource uh, links for OTF Connects as well as the feedback survey that we'd like to tell people about. Go ahead, Syria. Okay. Um, one of the things generally at this stage, Brian, um, I just give a general introduction and give the facilitators a chance to tell a bit more about themselves. And so I keep it very informal, very brief, so that you have an opportunity to to give your background and uh, um, which I think is a lot more meaningful than me reading something. Okay. Yeah. And that, that really hammers home that it's uh, that teachers are learning from and with a colleague as well. Okay, so that's kind of the timeline. All right, let's get right into the, the platform. Uh, here's a brief overview of all the tools that we have and features that are under our control. However, we don't use all of them. I just like to make sure that you're aware of what is here and uh, the moderator will handle loading the content. So that's why it's important that we know everything's running well and, and when you log on early that night, the presentation should already be loaded. Uh, usually things load okay. Every now and again, the layout of graphics might shift a little, look a little wonky or uh, sometimes content's missing, but rarely does that happen now. And so we always like you to have that final check. And make sure it looks as it should and we can quickly make any changes if something's not quite right or even if you've had uh, a sudden idea of something you want to switch around at the last minute then we can usually get that done pretty quick then as well. Oh, let me just deal with that and um, oh man, I got two phones sitting in here. Okay, we'll just have to let that sound go for a minute and um, the managing microphones and cameras, we don't use the cameras during OTF Connect sessions, so I actually turn off the webcam feature so people can't use that. Um, and, and the moderator will help as much as possible to, to help people with their microphones, so that's done in advance. Moving through the content is using the slide controls, and now at this point, I'm actually going to give you your moderator privileges so you're going to see where things start to change for you, especially above the whiteboard space. And so those moving through the content uh, controls in the upper right, those will be yours to take care of once Syria does the handoff and says over to you, Brian, then uh, that'll be you that takes care of that from there. If you need any help, though, you just let us know and we'll step in if things get stuck. But mostly we like to make sure that, that you're able to move through at the pace that works for you. Uh, participant permissions, you know, we encourage them to use their mics and the chat. Uh, if you plan any activities using the whiteboard, we make sure they know how to do that. Uh, application sharing, we're going to talk about that in web tour. We're going to talk about that. And, uh, of course, we record everything and we've got a couple of other additional options, um, that are helpful for us as well. But we also have a lot of features that we don't use. We try and keep it as simple as possible so that people can get right into the learning and not get bogged down in trying to figure out the platform. Okay, so we've already talked about what the interface looks like, and, oh, okay. So, if you're clicking on slides as well, because you and I are both moderators, we both have the ability to, um, to move the slides right now, and um, so you've already tested that, <laughs> that out. We're going to get to showing you all the different ways that you can control the slides, because I have a feeling you'll be one of those guys that, that likes to use the page explorer view. Um, but in this moderator view that you're looking at now, we've got our three main modes of presenting, which is the, you know, the whiteboard, application sharing, and the web tour, those three big buttons above the screen there. Uh, we're in whiteboard mode right now, and we use web tour a fair bit as well, but we're going to talk about that. And, um, and then over here on the right, this is where all the content controls are for the slides. Uh, the load content button, we'd like to, you to know where that is, because if at our moderator end we should have any technological failures, uh, we will rely on, on you to be the backup 
for yourself. And then, I'm just going to point out quickly down here, uh, in the participants list now, you should see all these um, main permissions that participants have. So right now, you'll see in our list that web tour and application sharing are blocked. And I'm going to click on the little webcam icon. And now that will be blocked as well. You'll see the red X. So you can see what tools t uh, participants still have. They have the whiteboard, which is the pencil. They have the chat, which is the chat bubble, and they have the microphone. Uh, those will be the basic stuff that they have access to. And when you are switched to moderator view, you probably got, well, we're already recording, so you might not have gotten the recording reminder pop-up. But the night of the session, you will get that pop-up. And you can just close it or dismiss it. And the moderator is going to take care of actually recording the session. So you don't have to worry about that. OK, so going in, taking a quick look at the presentation modes, the whiteboard that we're in, application sharing, and web tour. Uh, and this is where I'm going to just go through it. And then you can ask some questions based on what you were thinking of specifically for your session. Because uh, lots of uh, facilitators, once they come in and learn about what they can do in Blackboard Collaborate, they, they may adjust what they thought they might do using, um, using their presentation. So here's the quick overview of loading the slides. I'm not going to worry about that right now. Basically, when you click your load content button, you're going to get a pop-up window that allows you to navigate um, uh, through your, your file explorers and go and find your presentation. I will point out, though, that it is only a PPT or a PPTX that can be loaded. And Blackboard doesn't really have um, the ability to support things that are more than 20 megabytes. So, and lots of facilitators use lots of images. And, uh, um, and so that can make your presentation get really big really fast. So if you do use images, make sure they're low resolution images. And, um, uh, and it does still have to be a PPT or PPTX. Uh, when presentations are really large, sometimes we split them in half and load half the presentation. And then as you approach the end of the first half, I delete all the initial slides and load the second half. But that's really not ideal. Um, we prefer not to do that because things tend to fail badly. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we, we prefer that you just try and keep your presentation uh, simple and so that it functions well from the beginning. Um, lots of people that have inconsistent internet connections as well will get a lot of lagging issues if the presentation's too big. So um, always aim for simplicity and that insurance things that go well. Uh, other things to note is that any animations or embedded video content in your PowerPoint will not be active in, um, in Blackboard. So if you have any animations, I suggest that you split that slide up into two or three slides that, that show each step if maybe you're adding a layer of, of an image or a next step, you know, one, two, three, or something like that. Um, yeah. We suggest that you split it up kind of manually that way. Okay. Okay. Uh, slide controls, you can already see this. This is what is in the upper right corner of your screen. Uh, the forwards, backwards buttons there to the left, the name of your slide. You can click on that drop down and see the title of all the slides. So sometimes if halfway through your presentation someone asks you something that you showed 10 slides earlier, you can go to that drop down menu and jump back to the slide that you want to show them and then come back to where you were. Um, that follow me button, it's critical that that's checked for you. If that is not checked, then as you move through the slides, you're only moving what you see and not what everybody else sees. So that follow me box should be checked. And when you're given moderator privileges, uh, you will automatically have that follow me box checked, which is why both you and I can control the slides right now, and both you and I can change what participants are seeing. So we just wanted, that's why we do the official handoff and over to you, Brian, at the beginning, because then you'll know nobody else is going to touch your slides. It's only going to be you. OK, the next button over is Explore Mode. And I encourage you to click on that right now. And that's the double arrow on the same button. And when you click on that, the slides should now have a red border around them. Do you see that? I do. OK, so when that is uh, activated, you are able to move through your slides without changing what anybody else is seeing. So if you navigate through your slides using the regular slide controls right now, 
uh, I won't see where you've moved to. We discourage you from using this at any time <laughs> during your presentation because <laughs> it's very easy to get pulled away and then suddenly about you know five minutes in the moderator is going to go, you know Brian, we're not seeing what you're talking about. Um, are we uh, supposed to be on the different slide? And you'll go, oops. And so, um, so we avoid using that one during the presentation. However, when you first log on at 6.45, if, or even if it's 5 to 7 or something like that, if there's people already in the room, I will probably tell you to click that button so that you can go make sure your slides are OK without giving everybody a preview uh, before the session started. Outside of that, we don't touch that button if at all possible. The button that we do encourage you to touch is the Show Page Explorer button, which is the very last little menu icon on the right. So go ahead and click on that. <coughs> and this slide here kind of gives you an overview of what the Page Explorer lets you do. Uh, you're going to see all the thumbnails of your slides. Unfortunately, we can't make the thumbnails bigger, even though you can resize the Page Explorer box. Uh, so whatever size you see there is all you see. Um, but through the Page Explorer, you can jump to uh, a later slide or back a slide. The slide controls now become part of that popped out box of the Page Explorer and are not above the whiteboard space anymore. And um, the other thing you can do as well is that the slide that we are currently on will be highlighted in white when uh, you're in the Page Explorer. OK. Uh, it is actually possible to move the order of your slides in here by right clicking on any of the slides and seeing the options that show up there. But again, that's something we would do prior to, uh, to people joining the room, um, if at all possible. Oh, okay. <coughs> now we'll talk about the web tour. OK, so the web tour is a fantastic feature that Blackboard Collaborate has. We do love the web tour. However, uh, you will have noted that we now uh, have mobile capabilities for people participating in the session. And one of the, the, the things that's not available to people accessing the session from a mobile device is the web tour. So we're hoping that that will get added in as a feature for my mobile users. Um, so it's a little hard to, to predict whether or not we would encourage you to use the web tour um, or not right now. So I can tell you how we do use it, and then we can talk about the options. Go ahead. Um, I would really like to use it if it's at all possible. Can it be included in that survey? That goes yes, out. yep, we can do that. Um, what we've noticed so far, you know, we've only had a handful of sessions, but I would say about, like the other session the other night, Siri, I think we had about 25 people in the room and three were on mobile devices. And okay. we do certainly let people know who are joining on mobile devices, even though we don't know who might be, but in those reminder emails they get, it does say, if you're joining from a mobile device, you will have some particip or what do we say, some interactive features have limited availability. And so I'll tell you what, what I would suggest so far, because we do think that the benefits of the web tour far outweigh the, the negatives of it. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to ask you to start a web tour, although during your actual session, the moderator will usually start the web tour for you, um, and we do have a long explanation for that. Uh, and so you can drop a URL in that bar right there that's asking for one, and then make sure your follow me box is checked. OK, so when you're in the web tour, so I see most of the content. Some of it hasn't quite loaded up yet. And quick question for you. Are you on a Mac or a PC? I'm on a Mac. Somehow I knew that. Um, <laughs> maybe I remember that from your Connect presentation, actually. And uh, so on a Mac, for whatever bizarre reason, there gets to be a point where Facilitators might initiate two or three web tours over the course of a session, share a resource, hey guys, go try this out, something like that. And then eventually, for Mac users, it stops working. And it may work still from the participants' view. We may still see the web tour, but it will freeze for you. And we don't really know why that happens, but it does still tend to happen. So that's why we usually encourage you to put the information into the notes area 
of your presentation so that the moderator who gets your presentation is working from it is going to see that on slide whatever you want to do a web tour, here's the link for the web tour and we will start the web tour for you and, and then you control it once you're in. That's why you still need to have the follow me box and that seems to prevent some of those issues for whatever weird reason. So um, that's kind of the process that, that we use for web tour. Now, when you're in the web tour, as we are right now, it is a live browser, so participants can go and click. I can go click on sports and find out what the aftermath is of the great cap or whatever right now, and I will go see that, and only I will see that, because I'm using this browser as an individual. You, with your follow me box checked, we will automatically go to any link that you click that is on the, uh, the public side of any logins if that makes sense. So any publicly shareable link you can take us to. Okay, so we see, yep, I just see you put Cyber Monday, we're looking for some deals. I see that list now. So if you click on any of those links, I'm going to see it. But as soon as you hit a login screen, then we will be left behind and we will stay on the login page and you will log in and, and go through. So if you want to show anything that's in Google, in your like Google Drive or somewhere in there or anything that's uh, a coding account that's got uh, login information and once members get past a certain point you'll be able to see a whole bunch of resources. So if you have something like that to share, you can we can put that in a reminder email to the participant saying in advance of the session Brian is requesting that everybody set up an account for this website. And what we would do is not do it as a web tour, but we would give them the link in the chat and ask them to go log into their accounts. In which case, what you're going to need to do is you can either include screenshots of what they will see behind the login in your presentation, or when we click put the link in the chat and they go out into their own browser. Um, here, let me just do this. The, uh, if you see to the right of the follow me box, there's another menu button there. If you click on that, you'll see one of the options is publish URL to chat and usually the moderator will take care of that. You can just say, uh, post the link there because what we usually do is we put the title of the, of the website first, like that, and then publish the URL and then people that go back later know what link was what because sometimes it's not apparent. And Siri, I know you want to jump in there with something. Go ahead. Yeah, just, uh, just a reminder that uh, people on their mobile devices, for example, I'm using my iPad here, so the whole time you were showing this to Brian, all I had was a web tours in progress. So it's exactly. important to plug those links in immediately. That way you keep everybody in the room participating. Yes, so that's what we do to, uh, basically what we do, Brian, is uh, even if we're not thinking about people on most file devices, anything that you share um, that is web linked or any activity you plan, we try and make sure that teachers have two access points to participate. So a web tour, someone can be passive and just sit there and watch the web tour and not participate at all or when we put the link in the chat, which we have to do for those mobile users, then we have to make sure we give them oral directions for walking them through, kind of giving them their own web tour. So you would say, okay, please click on the link in the chat. It's going to open a browser uh, on your computer and uh, I'm going to walk you through, you know, go to file, go to click, save, you know, uh, all those steps. You would have to just be explicit with sharing them so that everybody has that access point. Um, even people that don't have mobile devices, sometimes the web tour gets a little weird and so we often encourage people to just go ahead and click on the link in the chat and we'd like to have the web tour running though because that's what gets captured in the recording. Otherwise we get the big blank screen and people are off doing things and no one can see what they're doing if we don't have that web tour. So the recording becomes less effective as a learning tool if there's no visual there. Go ahead. Uh, I really love to use Scratch in this thing. Um, it, it is Flash and it won't work on an iPad. Okay. Can we include that in the survey somewhere? Um, I, I want it to yes. be a piece. It's, a, it's important that it's a piece of this. 
Okay, that's critical information. So for this session, if you could write up anything that you would like, you know, a note from the facilitator and include those points, uh, please log into the session using a, a flash-enabled device or something like mm -hmm. that, then uh, then that'll make sure. And for this, you know, we can just say please use a, a computer. Uh, you you know, participants using mobile devices will find using the tools less effective or something along those lines. We can, we can comb that uh, so that they get that information right away um, because obviously their ability to learn will be different if they can't actually interact with these cool coding tools. Can you can you see my mouse cursor and and block code when I drag it out? Or do you just see no, it show up? We, can't. we just see the little kitty cat there in the middle of the screen. So that's actually an important point to be aware of as well. Because it's an individual browser, we can follow you only when you're clicking on hyperlinks. When you're interacting with this kind of tool, we don't see that. So that would bring us to our, our third presentation mode, application sharing, which we can talk about. What we do find actually that a lot of facilitators find easiest to do is you if you do a little screencast, a little two or three minute video of you using that tool, then you're, you have full control of making sure it works properly within that short period of time instead of relying on it working when you do a live demonstration. And then and we, you know, you plop it up on YouTube or Vimeo, and then we share the link to the video, and we say, okay, folks, go off and watch this video Brian did on how to move the coding blocks around, and uh, give us a check mark when you're done, and uh, and share any questions. Go ahead, Syria. Possibly, Louise, you could send uh, Brian the link to some of the Jacqueline sessions because she does that quite effectively, just so that he gets it, yes. he can see it, um, how effective it can work. Yeah, some of our facilitators that are doing a lot of introduction to how to use various apps and tools uh, do a number of uh, little short videos, like here's a video on how to set up your student accounts, and here's a video on how to, uh, you know, add images, and here's a video on this. So depending on how you see it might break down, um, all of those kinds of links or resources, or even if there's other videos already out there that you can use, that works fine as well. And we can just share those hyperlinks with people. And it'll also become part of the resource page that gets built around your session. And uh, and so teachers appreciate being able to go back to that and that resource page they'll share with their colleagues. And, and all that stuff will be available without them having to go back to a complete um, recording of the 90-minute session. Okay, so so this is a bunch of content that you've dropped in the chat there. That was a mistake. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. I I can't even okay. see it. Oh really? Oh, that's okay. interesting. <coughs> well, the, the chat the chat window wants the chat window wants to hide behind. Um, the participants one or your main your main box? Yeah, it wants to hide behind the web tour. Okay. And well, that's uh, funny. It may be it may be your Mac playing games with this already. Are you able to yeah. click the whiteboard button with the pencil squiggle and we'll exit out and see if it uh, it behaves itself now. You can also when the chat acts weird, which sometimes it does, uh, we find that repinning it, so clicking on the title bar and reattaching it to the main interface area settles it back down and then you can unpin it again. And now I have it, uh, I seem to have it, okay, there we go, there we go. Sometimes it means uh, going back up to the main menu of view and going restore default layout, sometimes that corrects any weird stuff happening. Oh, I see, okay. Well, there you go. I was uh, doing, trying to do a word count on a piece of writing, so now you've got full access to it. <laughs> <laughs> we won't read it, I promise. <laughs> um, so that's actually handy, though, that you actually ended up having that particular issue. Uh, so it's always nice for you to have the little workarounds. If your chat acts funny, OK, go try this and do this. And we usually try and bring that up to participants. Most people don't have problems, but when people do, it does tend to be Mac users. I'm making no judgment on that whatsoever. No, okay. Okay. So was, um uh, other things sorry, go ahead. I'm trying to rush. Sorry, through a bit. um I I just paced for the YouTube video. Is that something you you were looking at? Something like that? 
Let me open that up and see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, something like that. Perfect. Okay. If it's if it's you know covers the content of what you're intending to share in the session, um, teachers like that. They really do because they'll remember. Oh, there was that four minute video. I can go back and watch that again tomorrow if you know I'm a little distracted by the kids in the background tonight or something like that. Then they sure. know it's there. And it's quick okay. and it's easy. And we do recommend, you know, and you probably know this already, anything that's three to four minutes or less is good. Uh, going beyond that, uh, sometimes it's hard to keep their attention. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, so I don't think I need to go through the huge benefits of sharing the web tour. I will let you know that YouTube videos, as soon as we drop the link, as we say, into the web tour and hit enter, those YouTube videos are going to start right away. Uh, we try and make sure that participants know that uh, for whatever reason, YouTube audio volume is always louder than the Blackboard session volume. Um, and if you've got a Vimeo link that you're going to share instead, we have to direct people to push play themselves because those videos do not start automatically. Also, any of the content that shows up uh, around a YouTube video that gets shared is going to reflect the individual whose who's Blackboard it is because it actually, uh, the Blackboard web tour is using Explorer. As its, as its foundational browser. And so if, if you're worried when you open your web tour and it's got eight suggested videos down the side of, of something you've been researching uh, somewhere else, uh, don't worry that that's, that's not what they're going to see. What they're going to see is the stuff that their kids were most recently on and there'll be you know nine My Little Pony videos instead. So uh, that's something that I like to, to let people know about. Um, okay, so let me bounce around here. Okay, so one of the other things though that's good to know about the web tour is sometimes if there is an activity that you say, okay, here's a great website, I'm going to drop it in the web tour, I'm going to put the, we're going to put the link in the chat, we're going to give you three or four minutes to go wander off and go play and find something cool and bring it back, you know, and then they're each able to direct their own learning a little bit that way because if there's a resource page and they want to know something specific about coding or something specific about a lesson plan in coding, then they're going to go find what's relevant to them and uh, and that's kind of cool. And then when they come back and share in the chat, you get all kinds of diversity. So that's a, a really nice activity to do. It doesn't always have to be a really structured web tour where you're like, okay, here, let's go here and then I'm going to click on this link and show you that. Uh, sometimes it's a, uh, here, why don't you just go wander and be free range teachers and see what happens. Okay, so we've already done this, we've done our test. Okay, and I never know why I go straight to the whiteboard tools instead of talking about application sharing, but I do. Um, so maybe actually I'm going to skip ahead because the application sharing for the longest time we we heavily discouraged uh, facilitators from using and that is because it didn't work well. It caused, it caused a lot of lag for participants. It still does actually, but it works a lot better than it used to. And application sharing still works for mobile device users. So I actually don't have any formal slides on the application sharing. So what I'm going to do is suggest that you try it out. And before you try it out, uh, think about an application you already have open on your computer. Maybe it's going to be the web browser with, uh, with Scratch. And you can click the, um, the uh, application sharing button, which is the one in between whiteboard and web tour. And what's going to happen is it's going to give you a pop-up window. It's going to ask you to share which application or select one. We do suggest that you select a particular application and not your whole desktop because if you share your whole desktop, we basically have, we're looking over your shoulder and everything's on your desktop. So if you get little pop-up windows of, uh, you know, emails people are sending you and things like that, we'll see all that. So we like to kind of protect you a little bit that way. And so just choose the application you want to share. And now I'm seeing it. Okay, I see Scratch. So one of the things that's really difficult for facilitators using application sharing is that now you can't really see what's happening in the Blackboard Collaborate session. Uh, we can have you set it up so that you can still see the chat, but for the most part, you're kind of in your application sharing and a little less aware of what else is happening. Uh, the second thing is that every single time you shift your screen, scroll your mouse, click on a different link, 
what we see refreshes way slower than what it's actually doing for you. So we do recommend that any click of the screen, any little scroll down that you do, that you allow sufficient time between little movements so that the screen can refresh and settle because uh, sometimes facilitators forget that and they move too quick and all we see is scroll, 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 refresh, refresh, refresh and we never actually see a stable image. So uh, if you have one or two things that you want to demonstrate, you can do that. If you're clicking on links in that top menu, for instance, that would be fine. Uh, if you can stay on each page for at least 30 seconds, that's fantastic. Um, scrolling down, that's a huge pain. So if you have to scroll down pages to get to links towards the bottom, that's not so awesome. Uh, but one of the things in application sharing is now we can see your mouse. So when you move your little hand around, we can see where you're going now, which uh, is nice. But again, if anything you thought you might do in an application share, you can you have a video already or you can create a short video for, that is a little bit more stable, more reliable, and, um, and it doesn't matter as much about what a person's internet connection is doing. But that would be one of the ways that you could demonstrate actually dragging the coding blocks around. But of course, even that action of dragging the blocks is going to cause a lot of refresh and lag and stuff for participants. That option is there when all other else, all other options fail. And we have done it before and it's, it's worked out okay. It's just not our first preference. Does that make sense to you? Oh yeah, absolutely. I can picture the screen lag and the mouse lag <laughs> when I'm spinning yeah. it around. I can picture what it looks like on your end. Yeah, and and know what? One of the things that uh, uh, more facilitators are doing now, and you could certainly uh, do as well, is the night of the session you can log in from more than one device. If you log in from a mobile device or a second computer, then you can leave one of them as being the participant and one of them is the presenter and you'll be able to see what exactly what's happening with your participants as you go through. That's always an option too. Okay, I will do that. Okay, and uh, so now I'll get through a, a few of the, just the, the handy technical things about the tools and uh, we'll play with those a little bit and then, um, uh, we'll, okay, we'll try and move through these quickly but effectively. Okay, so the whiteboard is obviously the space we have right here and uh, participants are able to interact with it except <laughs> for the mobile device users. Mobile device users can't interact with it but they still see it. So they will see what everybody else does. And again, going back to what I said earlier about giving two access points for participation or sharing or learning, um, if we give them an activity that encourages them to interact with the whiteboard, we always use the chat as our, as our backup. So the chat is nice and stable and effective and people can always contribute and share via the chat. And so that's kind of our backup for that. Uh, but that tool strip on the left hand side of your screen is the whiteboard tools and the ones that I have those bulleted points on the screen there for right now are kind of the ones that we like you to know about. The pointer one is important. Um, sorry, this is the select tool at the top. The pointer is the starburst and so if you click on that and sometimes it's a little annoying, you have to find the little black triangle that's in the corner of that particular tool and sometimes you have to double click, single click, just play with it and then you should get the pop out list of, of options. So changing your cursor to a, a different pointer is, is handy. The highlighter tool that's right below it is also handy and then the text tool and then the clip part is down at the bottom. So I actually have an activity for all of those things here. So we will go through them. Uh, the pointer has two ways you can use the pointer. Uh, you can just move your mouse and click. That's what I do. So I've dropped a little picture of my hand. Now I'm going to go down to the clip art and drop a picture of my hand. That uses the least bandwidth. If you want people to see the path of your, your little hand or your pointer, you hold your mouse button down and you drag. Now that automatically causes lag. If it's purposeful though, you know, a few moments of lag is doable uh, if it helps people see exactly what you're doing. You'll notice as I'm moving my little hand in great circles here that over in our participants list, you can see the whiteboard tool next to your name now has some very fun looking yellow lag boxes. 
So that's the indicator that lets us know that the content is moving slowly to a participant. If those boxes are red, there's a significant delay. And some people will just have a bad internet connection and they might have that persistently happen throughout the session, no matter what you're doing. And other times we can see when we've invited them to do something that, that uh, creates more dynamic content on the whiteboard that we're going to live with that for a moment or two. But it's nice just to be aware of it so that if someone suddenly says, oh, I can't hear you now, or the screen's doing funny things, then it's probably something we're doing that's creating that lag. And so then we just try and discontinue it. Okay, so then we've got the pen highlighter tool. This is a handy tool for some activities, um, and we're going to do a little activity with it. So the, the pen and the highlighter tool are two options in the same one. You have to pop it out. Uh, the highlighter tool, both of them, you can change the color, you can change the stroke, you can change the opacity. So sometimes we might have an activity like this, and we ask people to, to highlight according to what their needs are. Or for just you as a presenter, you may have a, a quote or something or a piece of the curriculum, uh, a section of the cur curriculum that you put up there on a slide and you ask people to underline uh, words that, you know, show that a child's engaged or something like that and give them an activity to do that way. And then, of course, someone who can't use the whiteboard, you might say, okay, uh, type in the chat. The, the verbs that you're assessing or something like that. And uh, and that can be an activity. Now, this might not be a relevant activity for, for your type of session, but it's kind of a tool to know about. Um, the text tool is something that can be fun to use, and uh, depending on, on what you're looking for, the text tool has two text options. There's a text box, and then there's a plain text. So the one that's part of a paragraph, obviously, is the text box. And so if you want to go ahead and type something right now, um, and I'm going to put a whole bunch of text here. Oh, I can't type the alphabet today. Do, 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 do. I'm just going to do a bunch. They can hit the return key, and basically it becomes a paragraph. And then as soon as you click back on your select tool, which is your top tool in your tool strip, then you'll see the text box. So I put uh, a fair amount of text there so you can actually see that it's a text box and it's got the little arrows to scroll around. So what happens is that the text box is a, a default size. So sometimes if people type a lot, uh, the moderator will just go in and adjust people's text boxes so that we can actually see the full content of what they've shared. Uh, but most of the time we direct them to use the plain capital A, which is the plain text tool which doesn't use a text box and every time they hit enter it becomes a, an independent unique piece of text that we can shift around. And again, as soon as they click any of the text tool options, there is a, um, uh, they have the ability to select their color and their font size. Uh, 18 font size uh, is, is fairly visible. So if you are going to type anything on the screen, we do encourage you to, to choose something that's fairly big. But we don't, we don't get caught up on that. We just invite people to go ahead and if they feel like playing with that, then they can. Um, uh, but we don't get people stressed out on picking up font size. Okay, so let's do a little, like this would be a sample activity of how you might use the text tool. So lots and lots of facilitators will have a slide like this where uh, they might put a question across the top and a little T-chart or maybe a four corners graph and invite people to share. You know, what are some ideas or what are some units that you can see using coding? And they'll just type and you'll get lots of content and we'll see all the little laggy symbols because people are typing on, on the whiteboard and people will contribute in the chat if they can't figure out their whiteboard or if they're on a mobile device. The teachers love this stuff. They, uh, they definitely like to have an opportunity to, to share. Go ahead. I love this idea here. Um, I'm just wondering, like, how do you foster collaboration? A question like this and having people type, how much time would you um, spend on this slide having this discussion? Uh, that's actually a really great uh, question. Um, it kind of depends. You kind of gauge your crowd and one of the nice things is that I give them at least a minute. Sometimes you don't see any activity or one person types something in or quite frankly our moderators are going to go and start populate it for you if things look a little quiet and that usually encourages uh, people to participate. Um, at least giving them a minute to get their thinking, to have that think time and then and share, and then often, all of a sudden, it'll just explode, and the moderator will be kept busy dragging and dropping people's bits of text because it's all overlapping with other people's stuff. And um, one of the other things that I would 
I'll point out to you, when you have an interaction like this on the whiteboard, it's anonymous because we don't know who typed what. In the chat, we know exactly who typed what. So if you put a question up there that says, oh, what are some barriers you see to using coding in the classroom, they're going to feel more safe sharing in this anonymous way than they might perhaps in the chat. So it's always nice to kind of consider what's going to foster their participation more. And uh, and so we do find that these interactive slides are, are really great. And people that don't care, they'll put it in the chat, they'll put it wherever. Um, but sometimes people like being able to just throw something out there that they might not normally jump on a mic and identify themselves as well. Okay. Okay, and uh, in terms of the whole activity, I would say two to three minutes. And if it starts to tail off before we've got to the end of that, then you can always say, okay, looks like we've got lots of sharing there, and you can draw your attention to a couple of the comments and talk as people are typing. And uh, and, and usually it's it's quite good. Uh, very rarely is it a dud activity. Um, and so you can kind of just roll with it as it happens as well. Okay, so the clip art tool is also another fun one, again, one that's not available to mobile users, um, and that is the bottom tool in the tool strip, and we teach people how to use this tool because at the very beginning of every session we have a map of Ontario that we ask people to drop a little icon on and let us know where they are. In fact, I think I have that in here. There it is. And so we encourage people to click on that clip art tool at the bottom, and then there's a pop-up window. They're going to go to Common Symbols tab, and then that's where all the fun icons are. And there's lots of different activities that, uh, that the clip art tool can be useful for. Again, I'm going to go back off my map here. You can do an activity like this, a continuum, you know. You can have an activity early in the session where you say, okay, uh, plot yourself on this continuum comfort level using coding in the classroom. And they'll drop a little icon on it somewhere. And then we can actually go back to that slide towards the end of the session and say, now where do you think you are? And then all of a sudden all these icons are going to get dropped probably at a different point on the continuum. And, and that's kind of a fun activity to do as well. Um, you can also structure a slide so that there's three or four different examples of how you might use something in the classroom and ask them to put a symbol next to the one that, uh, that they think they would use. You can also uh, have an intro slide that uh, asks them to share what grade level Back, Brian. Can you hear now? You'll need to turn your mic back on again, Brian. We're seeing the uh, the red squares of doom in the lag. Okay, so you can hear, but it's probably a little bit behind. Okay, I'll keep chugging along then, and we'll see if we can get through it. Oh, those symbols there. Five o'clock tends to be a bit of a bewitching hour because uh, everybody goes home and connects to their internet and starts doing all kinds of things. We will try and get things captured in the recording at least, and you can always go back to that. We'll send you the link and, uh, and watch the tail end, and we'll follow up with any other questions. Okay, so that was a little bit about the clip art tool. Um, it can just be engaging, and there's lots of different ways you can structure activities for that. Uh, a couple of other very simple tools that we have are the polling tool, I'll go to that here, is the, um, oh, and I need my pointer, 
here we go. The polling tool Okay, so it looks like it was me that got bumped out on that one, and you were both here. So I'm going to try and get to these last, we're so close to the end, and then we'll do any follow-up. Okay, polling tool. We have a yes-no option, which is great to just check in with people and say, hey, were you able to get to the end of the video? Can you see what I'm seeing? Um, have you used this tool before? Give us a green check mark or a red X. Uh, we can also change it to multiple choice between three and five options, A, B, C, D to E. And, um, and if you The microphone. Okay, the timer tool. Um, I think my mic was possibly off before that as well. Uh, I've just thrown a timer up there. You'll see it above the center of the whiteboard screen. It's an extremely handy tool, and as we've mentioned previously, if you do any interactive activity that requires them to do some thinking before they share, whether it's through the whiteboard or the chat, or perhaps they're off doing a web tour or um, or some other activity that you want to give them time, the setting the timer allows them to relax because they know how much time they have. Uh, it gives them a little freedom of movement if you pose a question, uh, and we don't have a timer, then everybody kind of sits and waits to see who else is going to go first. Oh, I don't know. Maybe they're only going to give me 10 seconds. I can't think of something in 10 seconds, so I just won't share at all. So by putting the timer up, even for two minutes for a question or a little longer for activities, um, then, then teachers relax and they will share. So we love the timer. It's very effective. It has a little bell that goes off at the end that'll kind of bring everybody at, uh, back into the space if they happen to be out uh, in a browser or doing something that's outside of the Blackboard Collaborate interface. So that's a nice cue for us as well. Tips and tricks. There's a few things that are handy to know here. Uh, font size, at least 20 points, actually makes it visible if people are on laptops. Um, I did say there, no more than 20 megabytes. I did load one that was about 28 megabytes last week, and we managed OK. Uh, again, about the images. Um, if you're going to share a video via YouTube or something like that, having a slide that's got a little screenshot of the beginning of the video is a nice visual prompt um, uh, for the moderator as much as anybody else, that when we know we get to that slide, have that link ready. And um, the screenshots of websites, so if you're going to provide information about any of those resources, having some screenshots in there so that they see what it looks like in case they don't want to leave the Blackboard Collaborate interface to go open their browser. Some teachers are uh, a little bit more uh, sit back and watch in terms of how they learn, and so having that visual there is helpful. And uh, including any of your web links in the notes area of your slides is a huge uh, time saver for the moderator, and it also makes sure that you that we have exactly the link that you want to share. Uh, sometimes I've posted a link for a resource and it hasn't been quite the light, right link, like I put the American website versus the Canadian one or something like that. So if you provide the links, then we know we've got the right ones. And, uh, and a, a good point there that we've certainly learned from other presentations uh, to, to include time for people to ask questions throughout the presentation and uh, as opposed to just content, 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 here's all the stuff that you want to share, now we can talk. Uh, we find that people kind of disengage a little bit with that. And so it sounds like your your topic will be well structured for them to kind of be involved in, and engaged throughout with, uh, with different activities. Uh, some tips and tricks for you as a presenter, as we found out tonight. So definitely make sure you've got your buds or a headset in there. Um, encourage the sharing. Um, your your session's well suited to sharing practical resources. So I think that uh, that you've got everything covered there. And. Next steps are, of course, for you to take what you have, do that tweaking that you need to do, send it back to us by the end of this week. If you want to have time to get back into Blackboard Collaborate and play around a little bit, we can set that up for you. Just let me know. And um, 
and I can meet you in there for a few minutes, resolve any questions, or you can just get a link to log in and go play on your own. And thank you, Brian. I hope that you were able to catch the last end of the presentation here after the 5 o'clock blip. If you want to try turning on your microphone and let me know that you're, you're there and you're okay. I'm here. There you are. Okay, fantastic. And uh, if you have any questions, let us know either now or later, whatever comes to you. Um, sorry that we ran a little bit a little bit long tonight with the various hiccups and things. That's okay. Can I so and can I just can reply to your email and send you my slides and send you like you know a rough? Um, my biggest concern is time because I've never done this type of uh, webinar before. Yep. Sorry, so that's can I? I'll send you slides. <laughs> I'll send you some yep. slides and I'll send you my what I'm thinking about time and, and I mean from your experience we can adjust more or less time depending on the activity. Absolutely, we can do that and sometimes it is a, a go with the flow when we actually see who's in the room and we find sure. you've got way more beginners than you expected, then you may end up spending more time on the, the how-to side as opposed to the, uh, you know, really getting into it from the student perspective, but um, ensuring that any of the resources you share kind of cover the whole range, that means that people still have those resources and can do some further learning on their own, but definitely we'll give you feedback on, on the time frame and how that might look once we see your content. And if you have an idea from, you know, even when you've sat with other teachers at your school and said, hey, you want to do some stuff around coding and you know kind of how long it took them to get to a certain point, then uh, you're going to have some knowledge there all already. And so uh, for something new like this though, we just plan our best and however it goes, it goes and we try and roll with it as it unfolds. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And Siri, I'm sure you're going to pop, uh, uh, pop on <laughs> and say a few <laughs> words. Will and, do. Now do you mind just, yeah, um, okay, is it time to turn off the recording? There's a few things that I want sure. to uh, Okay, great.